Welcome everyone to this webinar on taking stock of violence against women movement. Where are we? What is the future? This webinar has been organized by the Center for Global Women's Studies in the discipline of gender and women's studies in the School of Political Science and Sociology to mark this year's 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Currently, we're witnessing an increased backlash against the advances we have made towards achieving gender equality. Trends of concern include the spread of fundamentalist ideology across the world and the curtailing of civil society spaces. The ongoing problem of violence against women is one issue which is of particular concern. Gender-based violence continues to be a weapon of war in a range of conflicts, with Ukraine as being the latest example. As a weapon to bludgeon civil society protest, with Iran being the latest example. With women and girls continuing to face violence from known persons in their intimate relationships families and communities. Equally disheartening has been the backlash on organizations and institutions that engage in research, activism, and advocacy on gender-based violence. A recent example is the closing down of the Center for Women's Global Leadership at Rutgers, at Rutgers University in a sudden, virtually overnight move with no explanation. For those of you unaware, the first 16 days campaign originated in 1991 at CWGL under the leadership of Charlotte Bunch and Neve Riley, who is in fact our current head of school of political science and sociology. Thus, we're presented with an important opportunity to pause and reflect on our collective efforts over the last 30 years to end such violence. Where are we today? What have we achieved? Equally, what challenges do we face? What are the critical gaps? And what are the future directions that are needed? We have four excellent panelists who bring rich experience in research, activism, and advocacy to distill key lessons and new directions. We have first Ardra Manasi, who is a development practitioner based in New York City with expertise in gender policy, migration, and technology for development. She is currently affiliated with the International Institute of Migration and Development as a research fellow. Previously, she worked at, as the Senior Program Coordinator for Advocacy and Partnerships at the Center for Women's Global Leadership at Rutgers, where her work focused on gender, labor, and human rights. From 2019 to 2021, she served as the campaign manager for the Global 16 Days Campaign at CWGL, where her work spanned research, digital advocacy, campaign coordination, strategy events, and partnerships, with a focus on gender-based violence in the world of work and the issue of femicide is actually through the, her focus on the world of work, of gender-based violence in the world of work, that Audra and I first came into contact. Audra holds a Master of Arts in International Affairs from the New School, New York City, and a Master of Arts MA in Development Studies from the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Madras, India. Audrey Rosso, is Associate Professor in Sociology at the Université de Québec en Ottawa, Canada. 
She specializes in the study of contemporary memorial processes, including the politics of recognition and redress of historical injustices in relation to colonial and gender-based violence experienced by indigenous peoples in Canada, as well as the confinement and forced labor of thousands of women in religious institutions in Ireland. Aside from two book chapters, she has most recently published in French speaking journals such as Etude Ireland and Etude Feministe and Criminal Corpus. And recently she was a visiting faculty member at the Center for Global Women's Studies. We also have Stephanie Future Orel, who is the executive director of the WAVE Network. Stephanie has led in the development of a wide range of direct support services to women who experience domestic and or sexual abuse, including advice and advocacy, refuges, counseling, representation of survivors in the criminal justice system, helplines, group programs, prevention work with young people and specialist support services for women with complex needs, trafficked women and those from minoritized backgrounds. She holds a master's degree in political science from the University of Vienna, as well as a master's degree in development management from the London School of Economics. She has also volunteered for several community projects dedicated to empowering women and young people around the world in Brazil, India, Bolivia, Portugal, and so on. And last but not least is Simone George. It's a human rights lawyer and activist and also a consultant commercial litigator based in Ireland. As a human rights lawyer, she represents women who are experiencing abuse and is presently researching why those in our systems do not adequately get justice. She co-authored the report, The Lawlessness of the Home with an Irish NGO, finding that we are all responsible for women and children's right to bodily integrity and to liberty. She co-created a summit in 2016 on women and children's rights, gathering the world's foremost thinker and activists together in Dublin. This work led to significant amendments to legislation and a new landscape of social and political justice in Ireland. She is, master's uh, she is a master's graduate from the College of Europe Burgess and holds a diploma from Harvard and is a double graduate of NUI Galway. I'm absolutely delighted that we have these four panelists to walk us through a conversation on the future directions, on what we have achieved and the future directions of the Violence Against Women movement. So to kick off the discussions, let me begin asking each of you, what have been the significant achievements of our work to address violence against women thus far? Ardra, would you begin? Uh, thank you, Nada, for having me here. Uh, to respond to your question, based on my work, especially with the Global 16 Days Campaign at Center for Women's Global Leadership, what I've seen during the past few years uh, in terms of achievement is, of course, the adoption of ILO Convention 190, and which is the first international treaty to address violence and harassment in the world of work. So ILO Convention 190, C190 as we refer to it, was adopted in June 2019. And I, I really, during the past few years, I really saw that uh, C190 acted as a catalyst to bring together both women's rights movement and labor rights movement. That I really see it as an achievement. Uh, and if you, if I really want to like introduce a convention, if some of you in the audience are new to it. I look at mentioned 190, uh, again, as I mentioned, it's the first international treaty to address violence and harassment. Uh, and it has some seminal features. For instance, it applies to both formal and informal sectors. 
it applies to, uh, I mean, it considers the world of work as including both private and public spaces. Also, it is a legally binding convention, which means if a country ratifies a convention, they are bound to put in place policies and laws to address violence and harassment in the world of work. Another seminal feature that I can think of, we were talking about domestic violence. I know some of the panelists are really like working in that arena as well. And this convention really talks about domestic violence as a workplace issue, which affects a woman's health, productivity, safety, and so on. So, I mean, it's a very comprehensive idea about what constitutes violence in the world of work. And uh, what I've seen is around, uh, I mean, it also makes a connection between discrimination and violence because the convention clearly states that women and girls are disproportionately impacted by violence and harassment. So it makes a connection between discrimination and violence. And about 22 countries till date has, have ratified this convention. But uh, I mean, at CWDL, we always believe that we don't need to wait for ratification. We can start implementing the convention through different frameworks. Uh, and according to a recent survey, which was released by ITUC, International Trade Union Confederation, uh, based on a survey like uh, among 79 countries like trade unions in 79 countries they kind of expect 50 countries to ratify this convention by 2023 so let's hope that that really happens uh, so that's one of the recent developments and especially working in this space gbv in the world of work i've really seen the power of coalition building over the past few years so i really see that as an achievement too and especially for instance in 2020 the Global 16 Days campaign focused on uh, the informal sector, especially women workers. We were looking at almost 740 million informal women workers impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And these are women without labor, you know, they are excluded from labor laws. They don't have social protection and so on. So uh, we were looking at informal sector in that space. And I've really seen organizations uh, working in the informal sector, say, be it with different sectors, like waste pickers, sex workers, domestic workers, uh, et cetera, like coming together during uh, during the campaign period and really like advocating for the ratification of the convention as well as shedding light on, you know, the uh, challenges faced by, you know, different sectors. So I would say part of coalition building, which has really taken place in this space, it's an achievement. And uh, lastly, I really want to, uh, again, share one of my observation, which is, Past few years, as we are aware, we, we were heavily dependent on, you know, the online mediums and social media because of the pandemic. And these were also years we actively used social media as a tool for the campaigning. So uh, one of my, the questions I was always interested in was, how can we actually uh, translate this digital activism into grassroots action on the ground? Uh, and I've really seen that happen during these years, as I mentioned, especially in 2020, when we really focus on the informal sector and informal women workers. Uh, I saw that the global campaign theme was taken up by organizations in India and also like worker, other worker organizations, especially in India and Sri Lanka, to raise awareness on the ground. So they use the global theme, they use these social media assets to really raise awareness among workers on the ground. So yes, uh, that can actually happen, but I also want to acknowledge that there is, a, there is a gender digital divide existing, and we need to acknowledge that as well. And I've also seen uh, interesting practices, especially from an activist space. For instance, when we organized a Twitter chat, this was again in 2020, uh, I remember a colleague from Viego, Viego is an organization working with informal women workers, and she kind of uh, suggested that most of the workers are not on Twitter, and we are organizing this Twitter chat, especially with an expert group there. So how do you make it more participatory? And she kind of suggested that we, we kind of translate some of these Twitter chat questions into different languages and post them in a WhatsApp group with workers and, you know, and collect their inputs, which can be again translated into the Twitter space. So I'm basically trying to suggest that we can find ways to work around it, though there is maybe a digital divide. So yeah, I think these are some of my observations in terms of achievement, but I would definitely call the adoption of C-190 in 2019 as a huge achievement for both women's rights and labor rights movements. Thank you, Audra. That's, um, I'm very glad you pointed to Convention 190 because I think that is, it's a landmark what has been uh, an international agreement. 
and the the whole issue of digital advocacy and the power of digital advocacy is something that you know is important to highlight because it has really transformed the way we are organizing against um, violence against women. So thank you for that international perspective. So maybe I'll turn to Stephanie. Could you speak to us? What have been some of the achievements from the European perspective? Thank you, Anata, and thank you for having me. So um, what I want to say before I start is I come from a network of grassroots women's organizations who work directly with women impacted by violence against women, such as shelters, women's centers, helplines in all our 46 member countries. So I'll speak from a grassroots perspective. Um, what I mean, we are all standing on the shoulders of generations of women who have fought for more space and for more awareness about our rights. If we look at the last few decades, I would say that um, there are crucial advancements in awareness around the general public, but also in policymakers and lawmakers on violence against women. This varies, of course, in different countries and different countries are willing to listen more or less. But there is an increase of awareness. There is there are specific legislative frameworks internationally who've made a big difference, such as the CEDAW Convention or the Istanbul Convention. And um, there are also there's improved multi-sectoral collaboration between women, between women civil society organizations on the front line and some local and even some national government stakeholders, as well as health institutions. Um, and I will go into a little bit more detail on all of that, and because I also want to um, acknowledge and give the space that without decades of tireless feminist grassroots activism, we wouldn't even be aware today that violence against women is a systemic problem and a major obstacle to gender equality. So this movement has fought for awareness raising campaigns for specialist women support services such as our members in WAVE, specific laws, prevention services, and even effective perpetrator work. I'm saying this in brackets, because not all perpetrator work, unfortunately, is effective or victim-centered. So you can name really any major element of combating violence against women and feminists have invented it and fought for it. So the reason I'm putting such an emphasis on it, because this is not a historic footnote, but a necessary reminder, because governments today need to be reminded again and again that specialist services are key partners in preventing and combating violence against women. Because only if we work together in our different spheres, the women CSOs with their decades of frontline experience of what's happening to women in terms of violence and other forms of discrimination and the people who are deciding on policy and legislation, we cannot advance. So um, the other thing to highlight is that women specialist services, women civil society organizations are also a laboratory for constant innovation and improvement of practice. And we've seen that over the last decades. Services have become increasingly professionalized. Their service standards, for instance, for uh, sexualized violence service provision in many countries, um, for how you support the woman through the criminal justice system if she decides to go through it, because we have to be mindful, the majority of women who experience violence against women will never get in touch with either the police or the criminal justice system. But if they are in there, the women's services support them through it. And um, so the women's civil society has become increasingly professionalized, connected, um, and also has gained um, political space. And I believe as but OK, we'll come to the things that are not working in a moment. <laughs> so I will I will save this for later because there are also quite a few. Um, and also what we've seen time and again over uh, the recent decades, but also in recent crisis situations such as the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the war, uh, for instance, the war in Ukraine at the moment is that women's CSOs are in the front line of providing services even in times of crisis. So, for instance, our members, they've kept their services open throughout government lockdowns in the COVID-19 pandemics. They've even provided services where government services like food banks, or emergency shelters didn't run anymore, often without any additional funding or even political obstruction in some countries against them. The same um, in war zones. I will come back to this a bit later as well, because within the Ukraine and also the neighboring countries, um, our uh, members are those directly supporting the women impacted by violence in war, 
And in the Ukraine, the local civil society organizations were the first to respond to the impact on women and children, where large international aid organizations such as UNHCR or other agencies were still stuck behind the government red tape. So they are vital in times of peace and also in times of crisis. And I will get back to this a little bit later. The international legal frameworks, such as CEDAW Convention and also the Istanbul Convention, or if some people don't know, the Istanbul Convention, it's also named the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women, have set some key standards on how service provision to women affected by violence should look like. And um, the countries who ratify are bound by it, but those who don't are not. And we've seen also a large backlash against the Istanbul Convention in all our member countries. But it was the first comprehensive legal framework to specifically address all forms of violence, gender-based violence, as they call it, um, and uh, service provision and really set some standards. At WAVE, we are monitoring um, the implementation of Istanbul Convention in our membership countries every two years as well, and how local services comply or not because the NGOs have a crucial role as well in demonstrating um, the actual situation on the ground because if we do rely only on government statistics we never get the full picture and in some countries unfortunately it's a very incomplete one. Um, and in closing I've said this before the multi-sectoral cooperation between between um, women's organizations and government stakeholders has also been facilitated by the Istanbul Convention and because there are also these um, mechanisms such as the radio shadow reports from NGOs. So it's like the first legal framework that also institutes that you need an NGO uh, framework there. And every any gravy report on any country will tell you the same story that women specialist services are dearly needed everywhere because they provide vital services, a laboratory for constant innovation and change. And they're also the first to notice if there are holes in policy making and what works and what doesn't. So as key partners. So I, in a nutshell, these are some of the positive advancements from a grassroots perspective. No, I think you've raised a very important dimension, which is the role of women's organizations and front role uh, service providers. And as you say, they, they, that is where innovation is happening. And they are the ones who are holding the social fabric together. So very, very important points that you've made. And so this is, you know, and but you said this is seen in country over country that these broad truths do resonate. So I want to turn to Audrey to speak a little bit about Canada. What can we see as progress in Canada? Thank you very much, Nata, for the invitation and, ev uh, and everyone here today. Um, and sorry for my accent, <laughs> I'm a French speaker, but um, so also I want to, to just contextualize a little bit uh, since I'm going to speak a bit more about indigenous peoples in Canada. So as a white European descend uh, settlers and scholars living in Quebec, uh, of course, I'm indebted to a lot of work that I've been conducted conducted by indigenous families and activists, as well as indigenous and non-indigenous scholars, researchers, writers, and so on, uh, who expressed the experience and made them um, uh, more um, uh, intelligible and understandable for people uh, like me who tries to understand the ongoing effects of gender colonial violence in Canada. So more specifically, my uh, research at the moment is trying to understand uh, more comprehensively and more sensitively, the, um, uh, the lived experience of family and, uh, and, and family members who have lost a loved one, either by disappearance or by uh, being murdered. So Indigenous women and girls, there was a commission of, of investigation, as you may be aware of in Canada. Uh, we had a report of uh, 231 recommendation in 2019. And at the moment, the Canadian government with the COVID situation, um, I must say, did not do as much as it was supposed to. So we are still awaiting and uh, women, uh, Indigenous Women Association in Canada are still awaiting for uh, actions to be undertaken with regards with those recommendations. But just for you to understand a little bit more about this concept, um, the, I mean, the, the, the groups we are speaking of, because Indigenous peoples are very varied in Canada, we have the Inuit people, uh, there's also the in, uh, First Nations people, the Miti people, so basically there are those uh, three groups that are recognizing the constitution, 
but within those groups, especially First Nations, there are uh, a, a lot more, like we are talk talking about dozens of different cultures, languages, and um, and so this is why it's very difficult to speak like on a general basis of all those different groups and their histories. But basically, uh, from numbers I have from 2016, indigenous peoples in Canada made up about 5% of the Canadian population. And with regards with the women, it's a bit, it, it regards more about around 4.5%. 4 uh, but uh, when we speak about over uh, representation in prison, the prison system, it's about 38% of the, in, of the uh, people who are uh, incarcerated in federal prison. So it's an overrepresentation then that has uh, a, a, a rose from the 1980s until today of about five times more women in prison, indigenous women in prison in Canada. So what the, what was the road and the achievement? Well, that was the first question here. Uh, I would I would just uh, concentrate on one element that was uh, uh, that went to court in 1985, and that related to the Ind Indian Act. And we call Indian not as people living in, in India, as you may be aware too, but that was kind of the noun that was given to indigenous peoples at the time of colonization, uh, because the uh, European thought, uh, colonizers thought they discovered India, and but they were wrong. <laughs> and so this is why it's it's ticked to the legislation. So Indian Act really relates to indigenous people in Canada. And so what was really um, a, a, a sexist and classist and racist discrimination against women that went on uh, until 1985 uh, when the law was reviewed, but even caused to this day uh, still some, some um, inequalities between the people who are recognized by the Canadian government as having an indigenous status. So indigenous status, there are some, of course, rights and obligation that comes with it, but a lot of people are have been erased. And one of the reason, and and uh, I just want to point out again on something that was a, a big gain for indigenous women and their uh, relatives and descendants, was the uh, attenuation of the uh, as I said, sexist and racist and classist disposition of this of this act that relates to the 19th century, 1876, uh, and that was reviewed in, in 1985. And basically, a woman that married outside of a, a group, if you if I can say it, lost her status. So basically, she needed to move out of the communities, and uh, she could not be uh, regarded as a person with the cultural identity, belonging and uh, treaty rights or any kind of rights. So she was basically assimilated within the larger population and her, uh, her child and, uh, could not have the Indian status. So basically it re also created dislocation, uh, a rise in poverty and political disenfranchisement uh, and social exclusion as you may expect. So those women in 1985 went to court, they battled for over a decade to uh, make that uh, disposition recognized as being discriminatory. And uh, even to this day, I was saying that some, uh, you could have cousins and one a cousin is recognized as having an Indian status and another is not. So still to this day, because they, we are going two generation back, then three generation back to, to regain that status. So anyway, uh, it is still an ongoing um, gender-based inequalities and uh, that are affecting more than half million people and even maybe more than that in, in Canada at the moment. So I just wanted to point, maybe maybe I, I'd already took my five minutes, so I don't want to take all the time, but I'll, I'll go back later on on uh, the, the, some of the recommendation and some of the inequalities that are still existing in challenging uh, Canadian society to this day. So thank you again. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, that's also, I mean, it's a very important point, and I think we will come back to the whole issue of how are we actually dealing with the issues of marginalized communities or who are often have been excluded. But I'll turn now to Simone to talk about Ireland because she has been very instrumental in bringing some change into the law in Ireland, which is a, a point for celebrating. So Simone, over to you. Thank you, Nata, and thank you all of you. And I'm, I'm putting in the bin what I was going to say, because in fact, all of you have touched on points that have made some connections in my head. So excuse me if uh, this is a little bit 
um, ad hoc. So as Nata said in uh, introducing me, I have a strange hybrid career in that I'm a commercial litigator, but I also do human rights work around domestic violence. And in thinking about the signif significant achievements um, in our work, I think this kind of connects globally. So um, maybe to explain, in my early 20s, I did a lot of institutional redress board work. So I'm familiar with Audrey's work on the Magdalene Laundries in Ireland. And I represented people who were looking for redress from when we used to institutionalize violence against women and children in Ireland. And in fact, Audrey and I both spoke in 2016 in UCD, which was the um, anniversary of the closing of the last Magdalene Laundry in Ireland, which was in 1996. Now, in 1996, I was doing my second law degree and about to head to my master's. So this is our lifetime. And um, so as I was practicing as a lawyer, I met um, some women who work in uh, the specialist services that Stephanie was talking about. And they were telling me about access to justice issues where um, women are experiencing violence and abuse in the home. And we had lots of very interesting conversations about that. And I couldn't really understand why my profession and the system seemed to be failing them um, so greatly. At least this is, was the qualitative data coming from them. And so that led to this report uh, called The Lawlessness of the Home, where I interviewed the incredible experts and professionals in women's services. And I agree with Stephanie, it is across um, the coalitions of women's services around sex work and um, all those related, but um, specifically in domestic violence. And what I learned in doing that research became this report. And at that point, I became incredibly frustrated because I also knew from the other part of my life that that report might be launched, a judge might turn up to launch it, the Minister for Justice might turn up to launch it, but it would sit on a shelf. And much fuss would be made of the women turning up in Dublin and as much fuss is made of new legislation and no one ever asks if it's actually been instrumental in making any change or, or changing any of the statistics. And so I got very uh, cranky in the run up to that launch and the understandable focus by the NGO that I was working with on doing the launch. And um, maybe all uh, creativity is conflict because what came out of the conflict around the, the, the focus on the launch and how these things were always done was um, that uh, I wanted to build this, what became known, known as the summit. So it was essentially a conference, but actually it was a piece of communication. I was going to a lot of um, tech conferences at the time, like TED and Wired and these parts of society that we put so much money and focus into and get so much government support. And I couldn't understand why those happened in big, shiny conference centers that they made the one o'clock news, the six o'clock news, the nine o'clock news and domestic violence never did. Whenever I went to talks on domestic violence, 20, 30 people would turn up. It was in the back room of a hotel on the wrong side of town. And they were all people we were preaching to the choir. So how do we get everybody there? And so we made this event um, really big. We had it in a venue that was right up against government buildings. We invited people that we knew would bring the media. So a musician who was well known played at it. A drag queen activist spoke at it. We had someone from the White House. And so government had no choice but to call us and ask, could they speak? And, and then, then we gave them their place at that meeting. But so much of this was so important. And can I say, while we were planning this and organizing this, we weren't sure it was going to work. So um, we were, our intentions were, were, were good. But this actually led to the Minister for Justice asking to be there, which led to her tabling the domestic violence bill. It was 1996 again, that year that the last Domestic Violence Act had been in place in Ireland. And it had been criticized from the moment it had been law and had not been changed in, in the meantime. This also meant in, uh, as Stephanie was saying about coalition, the importance of coalition building, the people that were in the mansion house, including Nata um, and who spoke and then also got to know each other, then knew each other already to come together to push through amendments 
that actually made this legislation more than just doing the minimum to, um, I think it was Ardra mentioned Istanbul. I mean, amazing instrumental piece of legislation, but it only matters to the women who need it and the people that need it when it is implemented. And I don't just mean in the legislation required to implement it. I mean that on a daily basis, when you go to seek help and justice, that you get it and it's based on those principles. And that became then my experience of that not happening. So I went back into uh, a family law practice and I started taking the most in inverted commas, difficult cases to take. So we now have a crime, of course, of control in Ireland. Um, we had also changed what section five of our Domestic Violence Act, which means a judge has to have um, make reference to what domestic violence workers know are high risk factors for family annihilation and for extreme and repeat acts of violence, but had never before had to be taken into account by the very system that is supposed to be in place to protect those women. So we put those in as, as, as gates that they had to go through. But then what I have been experiencing since was that um, nothing had actually, not nothing, that's not fair. Um, not enough had actually changed in the day-to-day -day experience of women experiencing abuse and violence and then leaving. Um, uh, the conversation in Ireland had changed. So the summit did make the one o'clock news, the six o'clock news and nine o'clock news. And my one of my aims was that people who normally don't have to think about this would be talking about it. And when I went into my local um, shop the week afterwards, he told me that um, uh, one of the, the television interviews we did was on on the screen in the shop and everyone was talking about it. So like as a piece of communication, it worked. I think it started to change um, the discourse around it through the media and just in, in, in general. But then the human beings who are still in um, in the the um, gatekeepers to justice or to to being able to leave. As Stephanie said, not everybody gets to a solicitor or calls the police or is otherwise able to get to get out, but that the, the people that they meet don't um, protect the structure over the people who are in it. So while I think we've had some really significant achievements and great, great strides forward, I think we have to be careful about over celebrating those until we really very honestly in a self-reflecting way um, can say that they are actual achievements that have changed either the levels of violence that are perpetrated or how those are dealt with when they when they come out. And again, maybe I'm moving towards what remain as, um, as significant challenges. So I'll I'll stop there. No, it's uh, perfect because now we will trans, uh, trans, transition to discussing what are the significant challenges. But I wanted to start with the question of achievements because there's often a complaint that we don't celebrate what we have done. You know, we're so involved in trying to change that we can only see the problem. So I wanted to take a a moment to reflect on the and celebrate because I think the um, for uh, coercion co coercive control in the Irish legislation is a very significant step forward. ILO convention is a significant step forward, putting standards as uh, the um, uh, Istanbul Convention does for standards of service provision. Very important step forward. Even the 1985 court case on discrimination in Canada, it's a step forward. These are, this is what makes up progress. But at the same time, we have to be very clear and identify what are the challenges and really focus on what we see as the critical challenges. Because in any work, there are many, many challenges. But trying to identify what are the critical challenges is itself a challenge. So let me turn back to you, Arja, and ask from your experience, what do you see as the critical challenges, as Simone said, 
to actually build on whatever achievements we have made so far. Uh, that you have already touched upon this. I mean, if you look at like globally, we really see a regression on women's rights, be it in Iran, Ukraine, Afghanistan, and you know, we can like cite more examples. And I'm currently based in the US. Uh, and as most of you are aware, I mean, uh, lately there was this overturning of Roe v. Wade, which really guaranteed the constitutional right to abortion. So again, I'm, I'm actually living in this place where there is like more regression and backlash as well. And to think of an example like closer to home, I know Nada, you already touched upon this, but I was working with Center for Women's Global Leadership and CWGL is housed at Rutgers University. And uh, a bit of history there, as Nada pointed out, uh, it was in 1991 that Center for Women's Global Leadership, along with feminist allies from around the world, launched the Global 16 Days Campaign. And it was later that uh, the campaign was actively used by the United Nations government, CSOs, and so on. And we observe the campaign period every year as well. But coming back to the story, like earlier in September, uh, the program staff at uh, CWGL was, you know, abruptly let go by Rutgers administration. And this has huge implications for program activities or partnerships around the world. And the future of the campaign is definitely at risk. And uh, we don't quite know what is the future of the campaign. We don't know who will carry it forward. And there has been no guidance on this thing. And that's really like concerning. And it also means that, I mean, we are really letting down women around the world whom we have been advocating for, who are in situations of grave violence from around the world. So that's kind of the situation we are in. And earlier I was talking about social media and digital activism and so on. Of course, if you look at the global 16 days campaign accounts, be it on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, you can see that the online campaign is still running. And that's thanks to my colleague who really worked hard in September to pre-schedule this post. So there is literally no one there running the campaign right now. So I really want to emphasize that uh, that should not be mistaken as a sign of normalcy. So I really want to like start uh, with that kind of a personal challenge I was in. And I'm really grateful to all our allies from around the world for continuing some of the work we are doing. And thanks to you, Nada, as well, for standing by us during this difficult time as well. Uh, talking about more like broad challenges, again, based on my work in uh, with respect to gender-based violence in the world of work, what I've seen is uh, COVID-19, the pandemic has really exposed the cracks in the system. And as we, as, uh, we know that there has been a spike in domestic violence around the world during the pandemic years be it global north or south, every country has seen actually a rise in domestic violence. And last year, during the 30th anniversary of the Global 16 Days campaign, we also focused on femicide, which is the gender-related killing of women and girls. And femicide has also been on the rise. Uh, and femicide is the most, you know, like the extreme form of violence against women. We are going to the, talk, talk, talk about the extreme. And according to UNODC, uh, a woman is being murdered by her family member or intimate partner every 11 minutes. And that's like really shocking. So home is the most dangerous place for a woman. Uh, and what are we going to do about it? I know Stephanie and uh, uh, there is Simone talking about the role of governments and you know, coming into the picture. Uh, of course, symbolic actions matter every year. For instance, lighting a building in purple. I'm not saying that that doesn't matter. And solidarity matters, of course, and that's very crucial. But how do we actually move to the next step which is uh, moving from awareness to accountability, holding governments accountable. And I remember I was once asked this question by a student at a lecture, how do you incentivize governments, especially governments uh, who have like a very poor track record of you know, respecting women's rights? How do you in incentivize them? I don't quite have a definitive answer, but I really want to put out that question here. Uh, so yes, uh, moving from awareness to accountability, I, I think that is still a challenge. and. We, we are all like still continuing to work on in that space. And lastly, I want to talk about some of the operational challenges that I've seen, especially in running the Global 16 Days campaign. So usually I know like as civil society organization, we work with sometimes limited capacity. And every year we used to release, uh, you know, advocacy resources, which are used by campaigners from around the world. And one of the challenges we faced was like very simple, which was translating this content into like multiple languages. Again, I'm talking about access here. And we really struggled on that front. 
And this is such a simple step, but this can really ensure accessibility and that we reach like more groups across the world. So that was more of an operational challenge, I would say. Thank you, Audra. That's really from that fundamental challenge of actually survival of institutions that are engaged in this uh, area of work to some of these very nitty gritty operational challenges. Uh, are they're all equally important. And I think it would be really interesting to hear from you, Stephanie, in kind of from the European perspective, because maybe you have overcome the translation challenge to some extent, because you also have to work in different languages. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> this question, the answer is how long is a piece of string? So I will focus on the key points and I will touch mm -hmm. upon some of the issues that Simone and Adra have already mentioned. So um, one of the points that Simone mentioned is there are sometimes these wonderful pieces of legislation, be it international or national, and then there's a big fanfare on the inauguration and then they sit on the shelf. And essentially, so that's my main point. The implementation of legislation is very very lacking in many countries, be it the Istanbul Convention, be it national legislation. For instance, Spain has a wonderful piece of legislation on violence against women, which really fails to get implemented again and again. Because one of the things with legislation is unless it trickles down to the people who have to implement it from government agencies, such as the police, such as the justice system, or the social services and the health system, it's not worth anything. So governments have to invest in training those professionals because picking up the pieces cannot be left to women's civil society organizations. The problem is, um, so what do we need for governments in terms of accountability? We need a willingness to implement, to fund frontline services, women's services, but also to properly train their own professionals who are judges, lawyers, and so on, and not leave this to the NGO sector. And we need not only funding for the specialist service provision for where the damage is already done, but for prevention and that on a whole societal level, because without that, nothing will change in the long run. So I'll, I'll go a little bit uh, into more detail on these points. In terms of the, again, the fundamental backlash against women's rights has been mentioned here several times today. There's also um, the European Parliamentary Service has done some research on where the money for this comes from, actually, the money streams that make it possible for right wing and in the meantime, even centrist politics to push against women's rights, push against the Istanbul Convention, push, push against children's rights um, and, and minorities and women who are undocumented, people undocumented, all of that. And they, it goes back 20 years. So I can also put the link in um, if you want to this piece of research because there are hundreds of millions of dollars from the US, from Brazil, from Russia, from the Vatican, from very wealthy individuals being put into financing these kind of um, strategies and campaigns around Europe and the world, but it, we've seen it more and more in Europe. So this is also a reason why this is gaining track, because uh, Adra also mentioned the lack of resources that civil society often has, and we have nowhere near that budget. So that's also part of the problem. Also, in terms of governments, there is a move towards increasingly gender neutral policy making and funding. So, um, although we acknowledge obviously the concept of the gender based violence, we've now stopped using that expression ourselves. We start to use again violence against women and girls because all genders experience gender based based violence, but women are the vast majority affected. Um, and the issue is we see on European level there's an increase in government contracts for specialist services such as shelters and advice centers and so on being written out generically. So there are generic victim support organizations who work with victims of crime uh, or terrorism, and they're also very important areas to address, and we also need them, but they do not have a victim-centered or trauma-informed approach of working with women. And it's being completely brushed aside that actually women are mainly affected by these forms of violence. So uh, this is also an issue um, we currently try to lobby against with the new draft uh, European Directive on Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. It's 
um, there's a draft out by the European Commission since March. And although there are some good points, the problem is it's going into a very gender neutral and also centralized service provision. What that means is they are arguing there is a provision in there, a proposal at the moment for one stop shops. So I just want to take a moment to highlight this piece because it's important. One stop shops from a funder and government perspective sound very attractive because it means women's services, the police, uh, social services, health, system, uh, health workers, and even sometimes perpetrator services are in the same space. So they need to fund only one location. The problem is women go there and they're being pushed immediately into kind of criminal justice responses. They're being pushed into talking to the police. And many women have taken years to gather the courage to even speak to a woman specialist service, never mind going into a full launched intervention on criminal justice that they don't want. And additionally, women who are undocumented uh, will never approach a space like that. Women who have, uh, have been minoritized for other reasons, women with disabilities, and it also cuts off provision in rural areas, for instance, because funders will say, okay, yes, we've got this one-stop shop in the capital, but that means it leaves thousands of women and children completely unable to access service. We've raised this with the commission and they said, well, we have online provision. Again, not everybody has access to a computer or the internet or even at the even a public library is not an, um, a given in many places so we are concerned about this push towards gender neutral um, and very centralized and capitalist service provision uh, um, that the government sees um, doing this and then um, another thing, and I've touched upon this before, is the role of civil society organizations in times of crisis. So there's an outsourcing of essential service provision. In for, I can speak from our perspective, obviously, because that's where we most see to women specialist services, for instance. It was the case in the COVID pandemic. Um, governments have not given any additional funding to, in our member countries, sometimes they've um, asked the women to keep the shelters open. There was no nothing provided in the line of tests or disinfection or masks or anything. And um, it was completely um, unfeasible. They still took the women in at their own health risk because that, what can you do? Because the COVID pandemic though um, has forced a lot of policymakers and governments to see the scale of violence against women because it was no longer possible to ignore it. And that has at least given some perspective of the huge scale of it. It doesn't mean this will stick around, though, because it's often in the times of crisis, there's a big government initiative for a while and then it pets us out. So we're trying to keep this alive. Um, there's also the issue around um, the response, first line response in times of war and if women are refugees. So again, um, our members from uh, neighboring countries to the Ukraine, for instance, in Poland, also in Moldova and Romania, they tell us a large part or most of the response to supporting refugees has been left to the NGOs. The government do not fund this. The governments basically claim they have nothing to do with it. And that's what I mean as well, because you need to put the money where the mouth is. So, so they're saying, yes, and we are supporting refugees, but actually it's mainly the NGOs. And sometimes this is, this is a problem because women services have um, a gender specific perspective, which is extremely important when you support women, children fleeing for, but they don't have enough means to support tens and hundreds of thousands of people. Because another issue we have seen, for instance, um, that our members from Greece um, reported as well earlier with the Syrian war some years ago, that where government refugee camps were run, they were often not gendered or in even international organizations. So for instance, there are small details, and this is another what you also picked up earlier around the daily life um, challenges. So for instance, the woman had to walk sometimes 10, 15 minutes to the shower, so toilets, and there were further assaults happening there because the men took advantage of that. Or they completely um, failed to see that traffickers were coming into the camps offering the woman a shower and a place to sleep because they were so desperate to have some privacy and they took them back and forth into town a few times as if they were because they claimed they were from an NGO and then the woman disappeared. So our members also reported that in the beginning usually of conflict the refugees are fairly balanced in gender but by the time they get further and further west they're less and less women and a lot of those women disappear into trafficking, forced labor, sexual exploitation and other forms of, of violence against women. So Again, these are some of the massive challenges the civil society organizations are dealing with.
yeah, and it seemed to be insurmountable at, at one level. But important to understand these challenges, because I think we, we can talk about what is the future direction. So, Audrey, may I make a turn to you now? Yes, of course. Thank you, Ned. This is so interesting. Thank you all. Um, I just want to add on um, the realities of Indigenous women and girls in Canada as they are overrepresented in the victims of various types of violence, sadly, it is sad to say, but either we, we, with regards to, of course, domestic abuse, but also incarceration rates, poverty and homelessness, um, the intergenerational trauma associated to residential school legacy, and also, of course, uh, the child welfare system and the rates into the child welfare system at the moment is much higher than when there were the residential school system. So, so it is quite uh, shocking to kind of admit this, but uh, at the same time, so it is an ongoing uh, reality and phenomenon in Canada that the fact that women and girls are targeted and overrepresented and overrepresented overrepresent you, you see what i mean um into this kind of systemic discrimination and it is embedded into canada's laws as i've uh, referred to the indian act uh, and but also policies and practices within the institution as you are well aware um so we are talking about races classes gendered and of course, also um, the, the question of sex, sexual orientation too is very limited in how it is addressed. And we're not even speaking about ableism or so these kinds of interacting um, discrimination and oppression. And I just wanted to act on the, the it's not about uh, giving a lot of numbers, but it's just to give an idea that how uh, violence is also very, reported in a very small at a very small scale as we know the reality is much higher we we discussed earlier with uh, the other presenter uh, about the fact that uh, under uh, rep reported uh, act of violence against women and girls so the numbers we have is, they are already shocking when we look at how women in their lifetime uh, when we speak of violent victimization it includes any kinds of experience of physical or sexual assaults or any threat to physical or sexual uh, since the age of 15 so we see that the, it's six on ten indigenous women that have an experience of violence in their lifetime compared to one third non-indigenous women in canada so it is at much higher rate that they are um, it prevalent that they are prevalent to experience uh, sexual violence and physical violence in their life. And also when we talk about homicides, since I was referring to the national inquiry into the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, uh, this is not something new. This is something Canadian society has obliviated and we're in we were in denial. The majority of population in Canada uh, were not I do not aware or did not care about what was happening to those women and girls, but this is since colonization because from stories I've heard while researching in communities is that the fathers, grandfathers, they were hiding the kids, they were hiding the girls, they were hiding their women because they knew that they, they were disappearing when colonizers were coming in. And so there were also uh, tr um, people with that word, um, there was kind of a slave, slavery, of course, in Canada, a less more uh, to the scale of what was happening in the South in, 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 the, in the United States. But still, so a lot of indigenous people were uh, um, put into slavery and also black people in slavery, enslaved in Canada. Um, and so, so, so now I would just want to speak about more contemporary di dimension of it, which is uh, the rate uh, of violence uh, against indigenous women and girls with regards to homicide when we think about the increase we were we were discussing over the last 30 years what what we have done as a society and things that have perhaps maybe improved a little of what we're doing differently and how we are more aware and all of this and some symbolic recognition but on a matter materially speaking women and girls are still disappearing and being murdered at a much higher rate in the 1990s we were talking about nine percent of all female victims of homicide in Canada. Now we're talking about 25%. So how do we justify, how can we explain the increase in numbers, which is like five times more likely to be killed? Even some people say six or even eight times more likely because of course the uh, official statistics are hard to collect. And this is, one, this is something I'm actually working with my research in Quebec because we, in Quebec, the population uh, of indigenous people, of course, is a bit 
uh, less important in numbers because colonization started east to west. And so it's a question of how Canada was developed as a country. So we are, we're speaking about indigenous population around 2% compared to, in some provinces, close to 17% of uh, indigenous people. So again, there's a lot of disparity and a lot of differences throughout Canada. It's a very wide country with a lot of different indigenous population. But that said, so the commission inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls uh, really try to address the social inequalities and injustices targeting indigenous women and girls in this in, in the country. And even First Nation, Métis, Inuit women, but also trans, queer, two-spirit people. And so the literature is very, it's very uh, definitive on, on the analysis of the cause, the roots of the experience of colonialism and the stereotyping of indigenous peoples and especially the sexualization of indigenous women and girls uh, as being part of the, the, analysis, the analysis that is needed to understand, understand why they are more likely to be uh, victims of violence throughout their lifetime. And so the, the, the question now is that is, is okay, we now we examine the root causes, we understand a bit more why it's happening, but subsequently the recommendations that have arised from the report in 2019 are on a shelf, as it was referred to other kind of reports. And of course, it was not the first report addressing inequalities, gender inequalities, racism in Canada. We have had a lot of reports, actually almost hundreds of reports. If we, if we speak of provincial territories, federal government, I'm telling you, we have all the analysis needed to do the changes. Now it's a question of political will. It's a question also of how the majority population, which I'm, I'm speaking of the 95, 5%, huh? so the majority of people are non-Indigenous. So what is happening when the government invests in, uh, in, in creating better living condition, in creating more uh, house in, in communities where we know there is an overcrowded um, realities and what it brings as other kind of um, the eco it does with with uh, proximity, with uh, lack of intimacy, with uh, different, as I was saying, intergenerational trauma that brings, of course, um, the parenting skills that sometimes people uh, need need to 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 gain into into through very often through cultural revival and through different practices and cultural rituals and through language revival that were um, that were condemned and that were forbidden from by Canadian laws. So again, uh, the when we speak about the ongoing impact of colonialism is also to speak of all these different elements that comes all together um, and in, into, into um, really weaving this kind of reality that is very much complex and very difficult to speak in like five minutes, especially <laughs> to a very broad public. So I'm just going to end there by saying that um, what we hear on the ground and what we um, we hear from from women's organization, indigenous women organization, is they don't want to they don't want words anymore. They don't want people to have great discourse about what they're going to do. They want action, and the action is it take it takes a very long time because everybody, all the actors, wants to participate, which is great. And everybody, so these processes are so long and complex that on the ground in the reality women are still experiencing these discriminations and very high rate of violence. And there's lack of women's shelter and lack of uh, also for people who are having addiction problems and in, in the communities and with a very uh, cultural um, sensitive and uh, approach to how to deal with these realities. And so I'm going to stop there, but again, th thank you for listening. And, uh, and uh, I welcome the questions later on too. Yeah, you know, I think, <clears throat> what you say is very important because it's about how do we actually design new types of interventions that are based in this understanding this you know that there is this really wide history that fuels this violence and so how do you de design interventions that actually takes that into account because interventions tend to be focused on one or two factors so that's something that we can talk about. Simone. Yes, I mean, uh, yes, Audrey. And actually, isn't it interesting that um, 
we are probably the only the great granddaughters of those colonizers. In, in my case, I know that I am. The reason I am called Simon, a French name, is my great grandfather was a French colonizer in Niger and forced my great grandmother, who's an African child, into marriage with him. And my grandmother was born. And the reason my second name is George is because on my father's side, there was an English man called George um, who, uh, yeah, who produced my, my uh, great grandfather. So, like, we are living the trauma that is handed down from that at all its intersections. But we are also the representation of the resilience that has come from that and the refusal for that to be continued. So I want to also honor our um, grandmothers and uh, great grandmothers that, um, as well as all the women now that have contributed towards the work um, that we do by sharing their stories. And I suppose what I think remains is the significant challenge um, rather than challenges, specific interventions uh, based on what all of you were saying and, and then my belief about this. I, I suppose I sum it up in my head as um, Bell Hooks has this fantastic analogy or, or visual where she says, if you knocked on every door in the street and asked people, did they agree with violence against women, they would all say no. And if the next day you knocked on the door of every house in that street and said, do you want to work to dismantle the structures that create that violence against women or perpetuate it or don't lead to justice, most almost all the doors would be closed in your face. And I think that's what we haven't, the, our frustration at the last question, which is what are the significant achievements, comes from the fact that uh, to quote another incredible uh, black feminist, Audrey Lord, the master's house will not be dismantled using his own tools. So we, I mean, myself especially, uh, you know, work in the justice system that was never built to um, vindicate the rights of women at all and children. And we only had an amendment to the Irish constitution on the rights of children in the last decade. So we're working within a system that really isn't fit for purpose. So restorative justice has had its stops and its starts, but it's much more suited to where I think where um, um, violence especially meets at the intersections of minorities, as Stephanie was saying, refugees, if not. Uh, I loved what you said about um, the centralization of these services and I've taken a note on that because um, people are pushed into talking to the police when they don't want to and access to services and always access to justice. It doesn't always look like somebody like me or like the police. And I think that's a significant challenge in our mindset, like the things that for good reason, you know, that we've um, worked towards with the tools that we have for dealing with this, that maybe we need to take stock of what where we're putting our energies um, into those things. Uh, I think in relation to the, the backlash, I do see as a significant challenge, um, but I see it as a result of the progress that we've made to date. I think the progress was so hard and so fast in one generation. Um, I'm the first in my family to finish school and go to university. Um, uh, and so we made such great strides that often, you know, the lash of the dragon's tail is when he is dying. And that is what happened. And the democratization of discourse through social media, the reason Twitter is being dismantled by the right wing at the moment is precisely because this was a place that women were able to gather and that I would be able to find you, Ardra, again and ask really what were the reasons behind your the Women's um, uh, Institute being closed. Uh, we suddenly are able to connect with each other. And so I think that in that way, that challenge is actually an opportunity. I think since 2016, the things that we suspected were holding further progress back um, have been had a torch shone on them. And it's been very painful to have to look at that, but we now can see where they are. And also we can we can um use that to direct our our action, I suppose. Um I think another significant challenge in, in a very general way is 
in sort of dismantling the structures that generate and perpetuate violence against women, we need a more nuanced and complex understanding of violence in order to affect cultural and political change. And really things like early intervention, every um, person I've represented and every woman, mostly women, but that I've represented in my work, um, when they've told me their partner's origin story, it has been in violence in the home and where there was no early intervention. And I think um, the colonized and minority um, people that we work with and we learn from have a huge amount to tell us about interrupting that with early intervention. And that could be, you know, that could be done in one generation if that's where our efforts went to. But it means directing our minds away from punishment, the rhetoric of punishment and towards restoration, intervention, social support um, into the services. And again, as Stephanie said, that's not where the money goes. But why is that? Because the government, and I mean these in very general ways, want us to turn up with our report that we spent all year working on for a tiny amount of money to launch it. They'll clap. They'll have one person on the committee and then you all go away again till the next year when you get emailed. And together, when we can figure out how to say no to that, build our own stages, build our own summits and conferences, make them look like things that matter to mainstream society, make it matter to mainstream society, make the business case if we have to, but maybe we don't have to for that. I think if we rise to the challenge of that um, and that sort of self-reflection, then the new directions we have to, to take will become clearer. Thank you, Simone. <clears throat> You've actually, in fact, set out the new direction that's so important to do. And so I would just like to ask, we have, we're very short on time, just to build on what Simone has just said and add a couple of uh, additional points or directions that you think need to be highlighted. Okay. Um, so let me start with Audrey and move to Stephanie and to Audra. All right. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, um, one one point. One point. We could we could just listen. First of all, we listen. Focus on substantive equality and human rights and indigenous rights. That these are principles that were uh, written in the report of the missing and murdered indig indigenous women and girls. Continuing to decolonize our approach to, uh, of course, to justice, <laughs> but also to intervention and include family and survivors. Uh, again, find indigenous-led solution and services. And so recognize the distinction again, because we have a tendency in Western uh, thinking to kind of generalize and to um, universalize. So to, to try to decompose, to try to understand from a grassroots perspective, from a local standpoint, and also encourage cultural safety, trauma-informed approach, and we cannot leave these reports and these recommendations and these it's lived experiences, people, lives that are at stake and women and girls who are still, as I, I'm saying to this day, experiencing those abuse in, uh, at a rate that is horrendous. And I think everybody agrees. So let's start from there. And we need to work quicker together, of course participatory based and, and, and but we need to find ways that um, even though people will be um, maybe people will disagree with how things need to change but it needs to change quick we cannot wait uh, any longer so again uh, I think it's it needs to be based on survivors experience and uh, trauma informed approach and inclusion of family and cultural safety and it's a question of dignity it's a question of uh, of saving lives so thank you again. Stephanie, I turn to you, you now. <clears throat> yeah, adding on, um, adding on to the previous speakers um, and to Audrey to start with, I would also argue we need increased not only national but regional and international cooperation and collaboration between civil society organizations representing all 
women and be allies to each other to really push back against this backlash because if you don't do it together we will not be able to make it it's no longer a problem that affects one group of women or one country it's a global issue and we need to tackle it together um, we need to push for this space within uh, government policy making and Simon uh, mentioned early intervention and I as I briefly mentioned before I'd also say prevention so we need to push for more primary prevention because otherwise uh, we will go back again and again to picking up the pieces of the damage done rather than preventing them in the first case and uh, just as this final point violence prevention and gender equality completely depend on each other. Because if we are not tackling income and wealth inequality, where women are financially dependent on jobs where they are for, uh, sexually abused or harassed or from partners who abuse them, we will get nowhere. If we don't, if we impose restrictions on abortion rights, we tell women they're not allowed to decide on their own bodies. Banning sexual and relationship education from schools means withholding vital knowledge and skills from children and young people, how to protect themselves against abuse. And making migrant women's residence permits depend Dependent on their partner uh, makes them dependent on an abusive partner potentially. And also the forced sterilization of women with disabilities is still legal and common in many European countries in a form of institutionalized violence. So we need to address the different forms of violence that we all as different women experience stand together and demand our space and demand more resources to be put into prevention and also service provision while we're still dealing with the issue of insufficient prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. The, the absolutely right on the dot of what we need to do. And I, I'm sure Aja will build on this and add a few more points. <clears throat> Thank you, Neha. Uh, again, just building on uh, what the earlier speakers were saying, this is not a new direction per se. I think we, but we still need constant reminders that we need to take an intersectional approach in looking at you know violence against women and i know audrey pointed out indigenous women we spoke about disability like so i think it's very crucial to uh, understand that there are specific groups and situations of vulnerability uh, and many factors contribute to that it might be age ethnicity race sexual orientation gender identity migration status disability and so on so i think we need to take that nuanced approach whichever form of violence that we are looking at and i think that's very crucial uh, Let's start from there and I think I earlier spoke about gender-based violence in the world of work that was a, an area that I've been working in uh, and globally I, this adoption of ILO convention 190 as I mentioned is a huge step but I also want to mention here that we can start implementing this convention we don't need to wait for countries to ratify though ultimately we want countries to ratify it but at the same time and I, I can think of a very successful example I know we are running out on time but uh, there is this campaign called justice for Jai Shri which was led by Global Labour Justice, ILRF, uh, Asia Floor Wage Alliance, and TTCU, a, a trade union in Tamil Nadu. So this resulted from the murder of a garment worker. She faced months of harassment from her supervisor, and finally she was murdered. And she was working for a supplier unit, which in turn worked for the global fashion giant H&M. So this whole movement was led by her trade union. They joined forces with other you know, global organizations. Global 16 Days Campaign was also one of the allies. And finally, in uh, earlier in April this year, they signed an agreement, uh, which is called Difficult Agreement, which provides protection for 5,000 garment workers. And this agreement really uses frameworks from an ILO convention. So this is just an example of a convention which, you know, uh, which is being implemented even before ratification. So we can come up with different frameworks, be it collective bargaining agreements or frameworks that uh, employers and trade unions can develop and start implementing it. So I just wanted to like point us in that direction as well. Uh, and I think, uh, again, this is one of the recurring themes that have come up. The importance of coalition and partnerships is very crucial. And I think it's very crucial for us to ally who are our targets and also who are our allies. It can be faith-based institutions, it can be civil society, it can be academia, but I think it's very crucial for any movement to identify your targets and allies. And lastly, I really want to mention the importance of data. Of course, political will is important. We, I think we actually, all of us like, spoke about the role of governments in there, but at the same time, we need data to influence policy outcomes, laws and policies. And I did mention about femicide earlier. Uh, 
the gender related killing of women and what we have seen in this space, especially working with the UN system and also governments. Some countries are not even ready to acknowledge that there are femicides happening in their you know, country. And for instance, uh, something like dowry related deaths in India, they're never counted as femicides or gender related killing. So we need more data on these lines. There is a dearth of data there. And uh, one of the, again, new directions I want to talk about, there is a great framework released by UN ODC and UN Women. It's a statistical framework to actually understand femicides or gender related killings in both public and private spaces. So I think some of you might find that useful. And I've left, I've uh, actually posted some of these resources in the chat box from the campaign, uh, focusing on, you know, actions, specific actions that we can take in the femicide sphere. So yeah, I'll, I think I'll just stop there. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Anja. Uh, Simone, last few words to you. I'll, I'll be very quick because hopefully there's some um, comments or questions from uh, the people who are attending. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be very, I'll be very quick because I'd love to hear what they think. Um, I think the new directions we have to take are the old ones. I think we need to go back and think about coalition building and to think about what Gloria Steinem calls the, the circle. And the reason for this is I think some of the really great ideas since 2016, since this backlash have come from outside mainstream politics and from outside the structure. There's incredible things happening in grassroots organizations and in civil society. And now because of the democratizing effect of the internet, when women aren't chased out of it or it's used as another place for abuse and violence as a public space, um, it is incredibly useful. In um, 2016 in Ireland, um, a man uh, murdered his wife and his three children. And um, all of the mainstream uh, media reported about him and how he was an upstanding, upstanding member of the community, and how he'd been buried with his family. And a woman on a Facebook blog called Linnea Dunn wrote a, a blog post uh, to a feminist group she was part of in the small county she lived in that was entitled Say Her Name, Clodagh Hall, because no one had, her name hadn't been appearing in our broadsheets. And it literally changed how um, this was reported against, uh, how violence against women was reported on in Ireland. It still slips back to the old way, but that, that democratization of... Um, uh, effect of the internet has really been um, useful in gathering uh, women again into the into the circle where I think for a long time we've been at the pyramid, we've been at the hierarchical structures, calling for leadership, asking for funding, uh, calling for change, writing our reports and all of that needed to happen and maybe still needs to happen but I think we can um, take a new direction which is an old direction and go back to what we know and to gather ourselves, maybe adjacent and up against um, government, but to, to get these new ideas out of our heads into spaces like uh, Nata has organized today that we share with each other and, and build on that. Thank you, Simone. And I just want to add to what all of you have said, one, one other dimension, which I think is really crucial. And it is uh, part of what you said, Simone, about uh, organizing and extending of the spaces in which we organize. And that is that in, in some levels, the violence against women uh, movement um, needs to develop its links, wider links to other movements. I mean, that we must be engaged with from front and center in the movements around uh, climate change. And, resisting the kind of destruction of our environment. We need to be in the forefront of workers' movements because there is so much resistance now that is being developed. And that is why the ILO convention is so important, that we need to be engaged with those union struggles, that we need to be with um, the LBGTQ, we need to be with those with uh, sexual or different sexual orientation with the queer community. So it's violence against women tended to be seen as some sort of women's issue. It's not a woman's issue. 
violence against women, it's not just gender-based violence, violence against women is an issue that has important implications to all other movements that are going on to protect our life as we know it, you know, to protect this life as we know it, of the society and of the earth. And so that's where I would say we need, we have a responsibility to be extending our networks in that direction also. So let us take one moment. Uh, there are no questions. Is it that we've covered everything? No one is, has any, um, um, it, you know, it doesn't have to be questions, comments. It would be great to hear from you. Any comments from the audience about what we've said? Do you want to dispute something? Maybe not a while while we're we're waiting. What occurred to me when you were speaking there is the inclusion of men in this conversation. You know, there's there's a view that the brand violence against women is part of our problem because we don't say I work in male violence against women when we're talking about 90 in the 90 percentile of perpetrators um, of violence are men and whether that is something that we need to really seriously think about now. Are we ready to rebrand? Yeah. No, and I think involving men is definitely important um, as allies, but also, you know, while there is this whole emphasis on being gender neutral. Um, it is also, we need to recognize that there are men who experience violence and they have needs that do have to be met. But as feminists, that actually is part of our movement. It, and that's what we're in some ways giving exceeding space to those groups that say they're only focusing on men who experience violence as so women are anti-men. We're not anti-men. We are against anyone experiencing violence because violence is about power and feminism about is changing about is about changing the power structure. So well, I'm not quite sure why there are no comments from the audience. Yes, Audrey. I, I just wanted to to add on uh, on something that uh, Simone just uh, just brought to to the table regarding um, the definition of this idea of perpetrator perpetrator victim and the, that relationship and sometimes a victim has been uh, a perpetrator has been a victim and it's, so these kinds of re like difficult relationship in thinking the in the binarity of uh, of that dynamic um, of violence but within indigenous communities and especially if, um, uh, indigenous women that sometimes don't come don't call themselves a feminist I must say uh, because this is such a Westerner way of thinking so they rejected that and and so one of the um, I just want to point to this it's a little little element of discourse but I think it it shows a lot more with regards to values and principles and uh, the also the holistic way of thinking the circularity of things within a lot of uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit uh, people. So I, I'm not a, an indigenous person myself. So again, I'm just speaking about these things, not really knowing what I'm speaking about, but this question of, of relationship and holistic approach. They, so they discuss more family violence. Uh, they don't they don't really use this idea of domestic abuse. They really discuss this idea of the circularity of the hurt and what has been done through colonization and the in, 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 um, residential schools and so all the suppression of uh, some parenting abilities and because of our 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 discriminatory laws in Canada so anyway so just to say that a question of positioning also the question of violence is to put it in in this very complex and dynamic system of uh, people who have um, uh, occupied many many positions within that kind of circle so again and it's 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 a, sadly a continuing Thing. So, so how do we break with that, with that circularity of violence and and and, and lateral violence and 
internal violence. So again, uh, thinking that plurality and trying to find ways of which is going to be meaningful and really, again, useful in the sense of like gaining more um, cultural ability and, and a new way of understanding uh, how people are affected, directly affected, indigenous women, girls, men, youth. Um, so just an idea, it was just a uh, food for thoughts. <laughs> it, is, it is so much more useful because it also removes the blame, which you might think is useful if what you're trying to achieve is some sort of punishment or civil intervention, like a barring order or something like that. But in fact, all it does is remove what's happening from the home. It continues in the family and in the community played out in different ways and actually maybe to not think in that dualistic way and to think, well, what if we had a wholesale rethink of how we describe this and therefore the interventions like early intervention when children are experiencing that and the intervention being with support, not the police at your door, but with support for people who have trouble parenting and uh, people who have trouble with violence because that's emotionally how they are able to interact with with their loved ones. Thank you, that's really helpful. Okay, um, so we have uh, three comments uh, in the chat box. So I just will uh, read them out. The first one uh, from Macaulay uh, basically agrees that uh, forming links with other movements and CSOs is crucial to hold governments accountable and push for women's rights globally. I think that's an important dimension of the violence against women movement is that it is a global movement. It's rooted in particular communities, particular nations, particular regions of the world, but ultimately it is a global movement. Uh, another uh, participant has said that it's a very inspiring and insightful webinar, especially hearing from people working in different areas of uh, violence against women and thanks us very much for the conversation. Um, a third uh, can, uh, participant says, it was so interesting to listen to all of you. A lot of information was given and I'm trying to digest it all that I can uh, fully understand because I'm also trying to digest everything as we all are on the panel. I agree that it is fundamental to network and create co coalitions that are inclusive of minorities to expand the discourse. I would like to ask uh, what are best practices we could learn from to pressure governments in the experience of the speakers? So any best practices uh, in terms of pressuring governments. Uh, would anyone like to take that question? Stephanie. Again, the, there are just some examples from many women's organizations, but what we've, there are two sides to it. So first of all, um, we need to get better and we're currently in the process of learning this as a women's civil society organization and also influencing the people who are electing the governments so to speak to the gen general population more because traditionally as CSOs or civil society organizations we've been um, targeting policymakers national internationally and often use a language that matches that but we haven't been particularly good in reaching the wider population we're trying to do this at the moment to reformulate some campaigns that are better understandable also by people who don't work in this sector because that's what the right-wing actors have been doing unfortunately very well yeah. so this is one side so really to influence the people who are voting from them and then two governments um, in our experience it's good to have a combination of data this was mentioned also before here and stories the human rights frameworks behind what we are asking for and unfortunately in recent years as well it has become necessary to use economic arguments for instance we've as women's um, specialist services we have been there has been research done in the UK especially but also some in France and in Italy on uh, the social return on investment that women specialist services give so that means 
what value did it return to society for the money that is invested into them? And it has shown that for every euro, there are between six to eight euros returned in social value because um, governments and the general public save on policing interventions, emergency accommodation, um, trauma and hurt and hospital costs, as well as lost working hours to the economy. So this kind of combination of data and actual stories of people, because also policymakers at the end of the day are also people. So we need to reach both what they can use on a legal and policy level and their human side. And also some economic arguments have helped. So these are some examples. And visual aids are always good. So we've also tried to, for instance, just in closing, for the Istanbul Convention, we've tried to portray graphically what it looks like if a woman in a country is trying to flee violence, uh, domestic violence in that case, and trying to leave, and how it looks very different in a country where the Istanbul Convention is and is implemented, I need to add, because yes, yeah. I absolutely agree with Simone. It's Thank sometimes you. very nice and abstract. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's really fantastic. Yeah. And I'm really glad you said economic arguments because that's been my bread and butter for the last 10, 15 years of making those arguments to government to press them for action. And I would say it's also organizations that are providing services do need to consider what is the resource requirement? What do you need? We don't have proper estimates of the actual resources that are required. And it's something with the uh, UNFPA, we're starting to do a pilot project of estimating resource requirement for service provision in three countries. And I think this is something that needs to be done on an urgent basis. Um, Audra, Simone, Audrey, do you want to add it to what Stephanie has said? Yeah, I'd, and this is a very personal subjective perspective, but I would say if you want to do something impactful and in the short term, fund yourself, figure out how to Robin Hood it. The minute you get funding from government, you are beholden to government and you are doing what Audrey Lord says you cannot do, which is dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. So when, um, in my experience, NGOs are effective, and I've had this conversation with many, they have their funding cut. So actually, if they don't, if they move from producing a report every year that goes and sits on a shelf after a launch, they then, and they do something that gets, um, that moves the needle a bit, their funding gets cut or they get tied up in red tape um, in justifying how it was spent and what it was spent on. Um, Brian Stevenson in the US, the Equal Justice Initiative, the Slavery Museum in Montgomery, Alabama and the Lynching Memorial is an amazing case study on that, um, if you dig around on that. Um, and he's incredible as well in, in sort of explaining how he did it, basically, um, uh, and how he funded that. And, and on that, he's another he's a great example. Um, and there are many is build it and ask government to come and cut the ribbon. So rather than calling for leadership, lead and um, figure out a way of getting, building the coalition around you that move what you're trying to do into the mainstream. And then they will come and knock on the door two weeks before and ask, can they attend? Because they can't not be seen to be there. And I think I'm talking about that in relation to an event or something, but actually I think that's how those big, jumps forward happen like to figure out and and when we do this sort of work we're very nervous about being shiny in any way or or um artistic or capturing using story to kind of to capture people and to to uh, not do that and i think like you know there the great ideas are all coming from outside mainstream politics all, all over the world look at what's happening in the UK now so that I think is it's very challenging but it's it's a great um opportunity oh and positively frame what you're doing so again violence against women it's that's tricky so like when we had the summit we framed it as we believe that Ireland can become the safest country in the world for women and children like hugely aspirational no one can say they disagree with that like no one can. And it actually made it much, much easier for women who work in this sector 
who are very reluctant to do media because it's always put into that binary and that polemic. You know, there's almost someone always invited on who's the anti-feminist or they don't quite say, well, I'm I'm for violence against women, but they don't not say that. They're, they're there for that dualistic purpose, but saying we believe this can become the safest country in the world for women and children. Like it's very difficult to publicly um, disagree with that, like positively framing things, yeah. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, so very quickly, any last comments, Audra and Audrey, because now we're definitely over time. <laughs> sure, Dada, uh, I'll just add to uh, that question, uh, especially on, you know, putting pressure on governments. And I think I second what Stephanie was saying and what I've seen work is advocacy and lobbying, of course, in that space. And strategic communication and data matters, where we really talk about the cost of gender-based violence. And usually we have, you know, what I've seen in like, you know, meetings with UN member states, we have just like five minutes with us and we really need to convince them that this is very crucial. So strategic communication, you know, using data to convince them and maybe like usually we used to develop policy briefs, like two pages, just, you know, with convincing arguments. That's on the operational side of things. And especially looking at, uh, the gender-based violence in the world of workspace, what I've seen really work is social dialogue, as you know, ILO calls it, where employers, uh, trade unions, like workers' organizations and governments coming together for like, you know, dialogues around this conversation. So in many countries that have ratified C-190, uh, the social dialogue has been very successful. These three parties coming together and, you know, uh, that really resulting in kind of ratification at a later stage. Uh, and lastly, from again, uh, based on some of our work, Global 16 Days campaign, we did launch a coalition in Nepal. And Nepal has a national coalition uh, with the government of Nepal. Uh, FWLD is the leading partner there. And they're leading a civil society coalition uh, calling on the government of Nepal to ratify C-190. And we, we were kind of partner to that coalition earlier. And what I've seen work is they were consistently organizing policy dialogues with parliamentarians, media professionals, and so on. So I think these are like additional groups that we might want to target it. Media is a very, like, you know, plays a huge, uh, I don't know, role in kind of influencing the narratives around GBV as well. So I think these were some of uh, things I can think of from what I've seen. Thank you. Thank you, Audra. Um, Audrey, were any last... Yeah, Yes, please. Just just a last thing, because I think it's, a, again, food for thought, because this idea um, of, no, I just forgot it. No, no, I forgot it. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, but, uh, the lack of trust. Okay, sorry, thank you. Uh, because th there's a lack of trust within the institution and the people within the institution. I'm speaking from, again, I'm, I, I'm a white settler I'm a, and I'm, I, I don't want to speak for indigenous women and girls here, but, uh, and who represents whom and which life experience is uh, put, put up front and with the words, you know, I'm in, in speaking my second language, if someone someone was expressing, if a woman, uh, indigenous woman, First Nation woman was expressing our reality, then it would be also very different as a part of representing those realities. So again, the, I'm when I come in a community, it takes years to build trust, to be, build bridges, to bring, uh, so, so we need time, but we don't have time because the urgency of the situation is so high. So uh, I think that there's nothing without Indigenous people and especially ind Indigenous women and girls. And now even at the table today with this uh, with this uh, wonderful panel, there's non-Indigenous women or, or maybe maybe one of you is and I, I'm not aware of. But um, so again, it's who is um, who is uh, outside of the conversation and who is within and who has the right to speak or the power to speak and who don't. So again, so again, food for thought and this idea of within a colonial setting, this lack of, this mistrust, this lack of trust, how do we kind of uh, rebuild it or just build it since maybe it was never there. Um, so these are very difficult, uh, complex processes and uh, so allyship and other kind of reflection that the scholars, indigenous scholars and indigenous scholars have written on and, uh, and so on. So thank you again for, uh, I, uh, for, for leaving this very small space for the question of indigenous women in Canada. I know maybe some of you were very aware, some less aware, but it was a pleasure to be there today with you. Thank you everyone.
Yes, and, and thank you so much. I, uh, what you just said now is uh, absolutely very crucial uh, aspect to think about as food for thought, as you said, because it is about trust. Ultimately, it's about trust and who is in the conversation and who is not in the conversation. And how do we, after all, human rights is ultimately about expanding the boundaries of those who are included in what we call the moral community. And so it's absolutely crucial what you have said. I just want to thank everyone um, for your excellent points and inputs into this conversation. Um, there has been appreciation on the chat box. I haven't read out all the comments. Uh, and, and thank you to the audience for being part of this event. And I want to end with first and finally thanking the most important person, which is Gillian Brown, who always sits behind this screen and yet played such a role in organizing and coordinating the logistics. And without her, this would not have happened. So thank you once again Ed, so much for participating. Thank you very much.